Actually, let me take one more. I took one picture just now, maybe two minutes ago, but I think the room is filling up, so I thought, let me take another selfie, so then I keep, yeah, I keep like a souvenir for myself. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'll start. So my name is Mary Grigleski. I'm um, a Java developer advocate at IBM, and I'm based in Chicago, United States. Um, so by day, I'm a developer advocate. Um, I go and travel to conferences and talk about topics that are in my area, so namely Java. And currently, I'm working on reactive um, systems and reactive programming topics. And by night, I'm a community organizer. Um, I'm also running the Chicago Java Users Group and also other IBM sponsor meetups in Chicago. So if you're ever in Chicago, please look me up or look up and visit um, our, our Java users group or any other IBM sponsor meetups. Um, I'm all for, for the community. And I'm, first of all, I'm also like, so impressed by the Bulgarian jug too. I mean, like big kudos to all the folks here who are running the jugs and all of you participants is a great example of uh, what a great community it is. And it was really great too to see Bulgarian Jug won the, the Choice Duke Award yesterday. And they really deserve it. And special thanks to Ivan who picked me up at 2 a.m. in the morning at the airport. So I really want to say thank you. So what a great community. So thank you again for having me here. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yep. So, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so today um, my topic is about reactive. Um, my title is called Reactive for the Impatient. Um, as such, too, um, why I picked this title is because reactive programming, reactive systems are intended for people who are impatient like us, and we are by nature very impatient. We want things to be done right away. We want systems that are highly responsive, um, no wait time. So, essentially, what, that's why I picked the topic. Um, but then, so want to make sure. So just want to make sure to this is actually a very gentle introduction to reactive programming and reactive systems. So I also will do a quick survey of four popular Java tools, uh, namely RxJava, Spring Reactor, Arca, and Eclipse Vert X. So uh, may I ask you first of all, how many of you are already working with Java uh, with reactive programming with systems? Yeah, so, yeah, so quite a few of you, so thank you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so please uh, pardon me if it's something maybe a little too introductory, but the, again, the talk is really in, uh, intended for folks who are newer for, to reactive programming, reactive systems, to give you a, a, like a brief introduction to it. So, so first of all, we'll talk about like why reactive. So reactive itself is not all new, but I'm sure to all of you uh, like lately, like maybe for the past five or six years or so, started hearing the word react, reactive. It's flying everywhere. And even for myself, I joined IBM nine months ago, and then I was asked to work on reactive um, systems. And then I was finding it to be very confusing too, because all these terms. So then that's what prompted me to do this talk, and more of an introductory, because I was sorting things out too. So first of all, like why reactive? So right, reactive systems, again, is not Let's see, it's not all new, but as such, right, we have like, on the hardware level, we're finding that their um, CPUs are better now. Um, they're multi-core CPUs. Um, they're also like um, all of the hyper-core um, systems, um, Intel. So all of the hardware is basically um, prompting the software itself to kind of get updated. It used to be more single thread systems. It's a lot easier to program and everything make use of all of the hardware, CPU clock cycles and everything. But now with hardware improvements, with uh, clock cycle and speed, everything, virtualization and cloud strategies. So all of these are, again, prompting software to get to, be, to become more sophisticated. And then also, too, on, on software level, uh, systems level, too, like think of us human beings. We used to just have maybe in, one cell phone to share among in the family. But now, not only one cell phone, uh, but there are multiple devices per person. So then the network access and everything too, it's, it's require a lot more responsiveness. So then software needs to get caught up um, to kind of like take advantage of this hardware improvement. Um, and of course, above everything, is us in, in patient human beings that drive this to go forward, to make it happen. So now, like what is reactive? So first, I want to point out to you about uh, the reactive manifesto. 
here, this is a link. I won't go into detail in this talk, but just wanted to point out there's a reactive manifesto, which is a set of guidelines and principles, and it's led by Lightben, the company that um, uh, is led by Martin Odersky, um, uh, creator of ACA, and uh, they, they, um, that company, they also manufacture or produces ACA, right, the Lagom and all the uh, Scala um, systems. And they, they, were, they are leading this uh, manifesto, uh, lead, leading guidelines to lay out what reactive systems should be. And the latest version is version 2.0 that came out in September of 2014. And essentially, to, to summarize, they just are more flexible systems and that are highly responsive and also very tolerant of failures. That's another major thing about it. And, it, and also in how it handles failure, that's a kind of highlight of it. So every time we talk about reactive systems, we all kind of look at the four basic core principles. First of all, systems need to be very responsive. And by responsive, it means, it means that requests come in, it needs to be, the response needs to come back in a very timely manner. Doesn't mean it have to be right away, but it really needs to be in a very timely, you, you know, you don't wait for a long time. That's what it is. And also too, then we look into like elastic, elasticity of a system, it means if there are increase in load, then there should be the resources in the systems needs to meet the, the load request too. So it needs to then increase the number of resources, processors, and it, like say, for example, in the ARCA system, there are actor systems that you need to probably spin up more actors to handle all of these requests. And that's what's meant by elastic. So then your overall throughput of a system, it, it doesn't suffer. So the throughput will remain the same, regardless how, of how many requests coming in. And then if there are requests going down, then, re then the resources should go back to the pool for some other things, yeah, to make use of those. So that's elasticity in a nutshell. And then resiliency, so that's a really important aspect too of reactive systems. By resilient, we mean that Failures itself too also needs to be handled in a very, very timely manner. So, um, so by um, by um, being, being resilient and um, and the recoverability of it. So basically, if failures occur, then basically there are also like components that needs to like handle it in a very timely manner. Um, and also too, in say in ARCA system, there's this supervisor capability that's actually is very um, very sophisticated because it has like a self-healing mechanism that would enable like components that are handling some things and they know they're under pressure and they know th themselves to tell the actor, basically my you know, supervisor said, well, I'm under load, please do something about it. So then your supervisor, the supervisor actor will either have um, are under pressure or yeah, they're, they're, uh, your failure conditions and it needs to like handle it accordingly. So that's what uh, resiliency is. And then also message driven. So by message driven, we mean it's basically it's the, it's the mechanic side of things in which it enables all of these other principles to happen. Because message driven itself essentially is allow a system with disparate components to be able to communicate with one another. And the message driven too, it's, it's very address oriented. It, it knows where the messages are gonna go to too. So, um, so that's what like message driven is. So essentially, message driven is enable all of the other principles to happen for our reactive systems. So, and before going into a little further, is that I wanted to point out some distinction. As I was starting to study about reactive systems, and I realized that basically there's confusing thing about reactive programming, re functional reactive programming, and reactive systems and architecture. So they are actually different. In reactive programming, what drives the flow, the logic flow, is basically reactive systems are event-driven systems. So then like there are data in your events that happen, and if there's any change in state in the, in the data, that's what is driving your logic flow in the system. However, in functional reactive programming, we're dealing with more like programming logic, so it's a thread of execution. So if there's, in your thread, you're processing something, if then else, if some condition is met, is met, then it goes forward. So essentially, it's the thread of execution that drives your logic forward. So that those are like different. And of course, too, I also wanted to point out there's also React, and so React and React Native, those are JavaScript, which I won't go into detail now, but React itself is uh, started by Facebook, JavaScript, and then React Native is the mobile. Um, enablement, um, and it's also TypeScript based too, it's also off Facebook. 
So I wanted to point those out. And then when it gets to reactive systems and architecture, it really is bringing reactivity, reactive systems to another level. In, in, when we're talking about reactive systems, we're talking about like an entire ecosystem that's filled with many components. And each of them are actually done maybe using the reactive programming principle. And basically, reactive systems is like the one level up, so it kind of ties in and coordinate all of the, all of the systems and components in how they communicate with one another, how they do things without stepping on each other toes kind of thing. So it's a, a bit of a higher level look into a systems as a whole. But I mean, it sounds easy if I say it just like this, but of course, to manage it, it's actually a lot of, it, it requires a lot of work. Um, and all of the, um, how you coordinate all of them, the state management and resource management, things of that nature, which, which I'll talk in the next few slides. And one of the things I thought I also point out too, when I was trying to explain, doing this same talk in India, and about a month ago, I was in the in Great Indian um, Developer Summit. Um, over there, I was trying to explain reactive programming, and actually I thought of the idea right away, because if you have been to India, it's interestingly, over there the, in the traffic system, there, there's actually, in general, no traffic lights, no traffic lanes. So everybody just dash across the street, <laughs> yeah. So in some ways, it's kind of a, in computing terms, it's like reactive computing. Because you have to be highly responsive, you know, things are coming, you need to react to it, and you can then dash across the street without being hit, right? Think of all of these cars, the little tuk-tuks, and they are like little, you know, like a little, you know, kind of like, they are like, well, right now they're electric driven, they call tuk-tuks. Um, so there's just a few people in a very tiny little like motorcycle kind of thing. And then also like buses and everything, you know, on the road, like, all these things going. And you can build up back pressure too, because they're a traffic jam, right? Build up back pressure. And there's some ways that you need to kind of like, you know, spread out, you know, the traffic and not all jam together. So in, in some sense, it's like reactive computing. Um, just think of it that way. So yeah, so I just thought I'd bring this up because it was just kind of an interesting kind of idea. I, it, that I was just trying to relate, you know, computing with our daily lives, so. Okay, okay. So now, um, I'll go into also explaining a little differences between event-driven and message-driven. So in, in reactive systems, reactive programming, we're dealing with event-driven programming. So what are the differences? So in event-driven systems, think of it as like a soapbox, somebody broadcasting a message, or kind of a, a, events emit some messages. The message goes out, there's no specific address that it needs to go to. It's up to the observers to kind of basically react to it accordingly. If I'm interested in it, I basically will have to do something about it. So it's kind of like, a, this is what the model is, there's no address associated with the message. However, in message-driven systems, um, we're talking about their specific addressable recipients. So they're like two people talking to each other. Um, over here, I'm kind of replacing it with an envelope. It's like you're talking to someone, it's kind of like old soap envelope, right? So you need to have an address to tell it where the message is, is gonna go to. And it also has some single purpose too. So that's message-driven versus event-driven. Okay, so now gets to this slide. The reason I put it up in here first um, is because just to pique your interest, because I know there's just a lot of talk earlier. It's just kind of boring. But okay, so when I'm studying, have been studying reactive systems, I was thinking, well, what would be a good use case? So I was in um, Tokyo um, back in December for their Java Users Group uh, conference. And then I was there and was hungry and went into a ramen shop. So I thought of the ramen shop, I can actually develop a system that actually uses the reactive um, approach. But I'll explain to you in a little bit, but for now, just remember that this is the example that I'm going to use. Okay, so I'll go back to some more kind of just talking a little bit. So basically, um, reactive programming, some patterns and terminologies. So we talk about reactivity. So reactivity is really, um, uh, it, well, actually, <laughs> sorry, let me. Okay, that's fine. I guess I, I lost my notes, so I have something that I, I um, written down. But reactivity essentially is um, it's basically um, it, like okay, so that's reactive um, programming, and uh, and and that's what it is. And then okay, so I talk about events. So events are what um, the data that comes in um, in your system, and uh, and you need to like process it, right? That's re events. And then streams are essentially like primitive, like streams um, that, that actually are 
having events happening on the streams. And observables are really the events that happen, that basically is up to the observers to actually react to it. And design patterns that we use are observer pattern, composite pattern, and iterator pattern, which I won't go into a lot of details, but I want to just point out to you. Okay, so here, I'll just explain a bit more about reactive programming. And using the Rx Marble diagram, which I actually got from rxmarbles.com from a reactive extension. So essentially, we talk about reactive programming. It's like up there is like a stream. Th think of it as like a timeline too. So up there is a stream. This is open receiving events. But in this top one, there's no event. There are no events right now. It's just an open stream. And then the second one in here, we see different shapes. These are marbles. They represent different events that happen. And then over here, there's a perpendicular line. It means that in, in this case, the stream has a definite uh, termination to it too. So there's a, a specific timeline that it terminates. But nothing is wrong, just events and then it terminates, the stream ends. But the third one in here too is a, um, a timeline, but there are events, then you see like an X. So what this means is a failure event. So in any reactive systems, failure events Failure themselves is also like a, it's a first-class citizen. So unlike your traditional Java programming in which we do try-catch statement and handle auto exception, in reactive programming, failure events is another event that needs to be handled accordingly. That's, that's why it's like called first-class citizen because it happens some failure, then your client will need to handle it accordingly. And over here in the bottom here, we have we have a streams with some events, but there's no end to it. So this signif signals an open-ended stream in this case. Okay, so this is the basic marble diagram. So we go to the next one. We we'll talk about, I'll, in this example, I'm using an operator. So in reactive programming, we call this um, function, essentially is the operator. And here I'm using a very common, commonly used map function. It essentially, what it does is it transforms the data. So using that marble diagram, if you look into like this, this timeline, we have events with data coming in, one, two, and three, and then we apply the data transformation is the map function. And in this case, it's just multiply each dates, data coming in by 10. And then the results that comes out will be like 10, 20, and 30. So in programming terms, then this is what, uh, what we see in RxJava. We use, do an observable, doing a dot just, it's basically like taking in your source, your data source, your events. In this case, it will be one, two, and three. And then you do a dot map, and you basically specify what the function is. It multiplies by 10. And immediately, too, then your consumer will subscribe to this. So you do a dot subscribe. And in this case, it's just doing a timber dot D, which means it's just output it to the system out print line. So you see the output when you run this. It will, you will see the result as item 10, and item 20, and item 30. Oops. Do we know why this is, um, we're losing? Okay, all right. So, okay, so this is just a, a very basic example. If you want to see more examples too, you can go to this uh, site, um, rxmarbles.com. Uh, do we know? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah? I'm sorry? Connection. Oh, my, oh, the HM, okay. Oh. Nothing is loose though. Okay, all right. Okay, well, let's hope it's okay, all right. So, yeah, so again, this is just an example I happen to be using. Of course, there are other operators like uh, flat maps and like the other um, filter. For example, filter will be a very um, commonly used um, operators too because you can have large streams of data coming in and you can just do a filter and filter them through. And so this is actually, I wanted to point out because you look at like reactive programming is, as compared with traditional iter um, imperative programming, it's more elegant because you can actually basically combine a set of um, directives commands into one single command in here. Um, so if you think of like in the traditional imperative style, then you have to like do like, you know, take your input and parse it and then do if then and then do whatever it needs to be done. So that's, I, I want to point out to reactive programming, may not solve all your problems, but this is just one aspect that you should consider um, learning if you haven't already done to learn about reactive programming because of it being more elegant um, in how it handles um, the coding side of things, so. Okay, so now <clears throat> going past 
you know, go into the next level, which is reactive systems, talking about some of the patterns that, that are being used here. We, we are different because of reactive systems being, it being necessary to handle uh, systems of many components like interacting with one another. So essentially, there are like six um, categories of patterns that we're kind of talking about for reactive systems design. So namely, over here, I just list these out. So these are like state management and persistence patterns, um, flow control. Um, if you've heard of like sharding and, and event sourcing, all these like event sourcing is more belonging to like state management and persistence. Uh, the domain-driven domain design, those are more persistent state management patterns. Um, then there's yeah, flow control and then message flow patterns, um, fault tolerance and recovery patterns, such as like circuit breakers and back, back pressure. Um, then there's replication patterns um, and resource management patterns as well. So for these, I won't go into all the details, but there's a really well-written book called Reactive Systems Design, which I will have to at the end of my slides. Um, there's a link to it. If um, you are interested, you can check into that book. Um, I believe that the author is actually a, a light band uh, person too, so it's very good. So I want to point that out to you. Okay, so a, a bit more like going into some of these terminologies. So when we talk about reactive systems um, in today's world, we know we, we are all aware of microservices now. There's also reactive microservices that basically make use of reactive principle um, to do things more asynchronous, non-blocking, that kind of fashion. So reactive microservices is getting popular, getting more popular. And it's essentially, too, we're talking about <coughs> reactive systems is isolation of state, space, time, and failure. Um, and some of the popular um, patterns would be circuit breakers, which I also earlier pointed out, too. One of the patterns, circuit breakers, is more with recovery um, type of patterns. Just want to point out is circuit breakers is, is similar to like your physical, right? Circuit breakers is that the idea is that there are failures coming in. We don't want the failures to persist, to go on. So it needs to be... Basically, a circuit breaker breaks it, so somebody needs to handle it. And then that way you don't let the failure to propagate throughout the whole system, is what circuit breakers is. And then there's also back pressure. So back pressure is when many requests coming in, your component is overloaded. So then there's got to be like a good mechanism in which you need to handle these requests coming in. And it basically, you, the systems will need to either increase the resources to handle these requests, or maybe slow it down. And um, or kind of stop the input from coming in too fast. So that's what like back pressure handling is. So um, for example, like ACA, which actually IBM has a, a partnership with Lightband. So the ACA systems is very sophisticated too. If you haven't already worked with it, it has very good um, handling of these back pressure and all kinds of patterns in there. So I encourage you to also look into it too if you're interested. Um, and then another two um, very interesting um, terminology I want to bring up, is, bring up is about high availability and eventual consistency, and also the CAP theorem too. Um, so in CAP theorem, just to summarize, um, is that in any data intensive systems, there are three aspects to it. One is the network um, partition, not network connection to it. And there's also high availability of your data systems, meaning the data needs to be always be there available. And then there's also data um, integrity, like consistency. It's basically accuracy of your data. But the CAP theorem basically is saying is that in any given systems, you can only actually have two among the three that happens at any time. So which means that network partition is always given, always there. You always have your systems connected. Anytime, right, you have systems in the runtime, network is connected. Then basically, your high, high availability of your data and also the eventual consistency of your data, well, one of them will have to relax a little bit. And in this case, because of high availability needing to meet the responsive, responsiveness of reactive systems, then basically eventual, the, the consistency of data can suffer a little bit. So the theory is that in any kind of given systems, you have a lot of update being done to your data, uh, your data store, uh, source, um, and basically, <clears throat> If you kind of wait long enough, eventually the data that comes back will be consistent because your update being done to your data will slow down too. So eventually, that's what it's talking about. You need to still respond with your data very uh, high available, but the data will eventually come to a very consistent state because of this. So I just want to like point this out. So. Okay, 
So another aspect of like reactive systems is um, a specification called reactive streams, and currently it's in specification 1.0, and it's basically it's a standard for asynchronous stream processing with non-blocking back pressure. Um, and it's led by Lightband and Netflix and Pivotal. Um, and also now Oracle, Twitter and Red Hat also has joined and Spray IO too. And the latest release came out in 2017. And RX Java ex um, only supports it kind of partially, not completely, but the reactor, Spring Reactor complete, uh, or supports this fully. Um, and Arca, of course, supports it fully as well. And how about like microservices? So how is it related to reactive programming and reactive systems? So in reactive programming, it's basically being used inside a microservice because it's used for implementing the logic and managing the data flow. But in reactive systems, it's reactive systems are being actually used in between the microservices because microservices we're talking about breaking up a big systems into smaller chunks and all the components. So th that actually reactive systems is basically provided a mechanism, the message driven capability providing the a mechanism for microservices systems to communicate with one another. And that actually also with reactive systems, it provides the responsiveness, the elasticity and the resiliency capability of the systems. And now also want to point out too, in, um, in Lightband, they have a reactive microservices framework called Arkham, and it's from Lightband, and it's built on the Play framework and Arca cluster. Um, it has an RPC programming style, it, uh, it supports that, and also a message, message broker API that's implemented in Arca streams and Kafka. And the persistence too is based on the concepts of entities like domain-driven design. So there's event sourcing and CQRS, um, so which is command query responsibility segregation. And I think uh, Hugh McKee, who came from Lightband, who also did a talk already yesterday on, on the CQRS and event sourcing too, so. Okay, so now I'll go back then to my um, example of the Japanese noodle shop. So just let me describe to you. So if you have been to Japan, you go in, there's no table or chairs and served by um, any servers. You go into the restaurant and you basically have one vending machine. So over there, one vending machine. You need to punch in your order. And it's all in Japanese, by the way. So, and I don't actually read Japanese, so it was hard to order it. And then at the same time, then you pay by Bring in, putting in your cash, and then you get two tickets. And then with that ticket, you bring it up to the, kit, the, the, uh, the bar area where the servers would take your order. So why I'm thinking of reactive programming? Because in terms of computing, this is very blocking, this whole kind of operation, right? You have to wait. You place the order, you have to let, stand in line and wait. And most of the time, these noodle shops are very popular, especially during like meal time. So I ended up having had to wait, and you can end up waiting in line for up to an hour at some of the really best restaurants. So I was thinking, well, why don't they make it non-blocking? So my, by non-blocking, what I mean is that, well, maybe I can do a mobile app like instead of, you know, we are programmers. We don't like to waste our time waiting. We want to do things fast, right? So if we have a mobile app that basically is an order entry, then we're like doing our work. We're like, oh, I'm hungry, so let me place my order on my mobile app, the order entry. And, and then basically pay by, pay by credit card, and then basically I just get back some notification essentially when it's about ready. So that's the idea. So let's take a look. So for me, I was like scribbling on a piece of napkin and thinking, okay, maybe you can kind of design like a reactive, uh, using reactive programming to kind of implement this system. So over here too, like think of the, I'm like customers. I place the order using a mobile app. So then these events, these are orders that comes in, they are in my observables essentially. So the observables are basically observed by the, by the people in the restaurant who are working there, the, the waiters. So they observe. So there are like orders coming in, then there are observables. And then <clears throat> they can't actually tell the cook to cook the, the noodles yet. Because why? Because then I need to have open seats. And by the way too, all of the seats are, we're seat sitting like around like a bar area. So very limited seating. So basically the waiters will then have to say, okay, I got order, but I can't actually place the order yet. Let me wait for a seat to open up. So the seat themselves also have and other like streams, essentially it's another observables, that when seats open up, then I, I basically know that the, the observers will look at both of them and say, okay, now I have an order and I have an open seat. Now I can actually then take that and tell the cook to cook the ramen. 
So in this case, in the meantime, we are busy programmer in our off home office. We are coding and all that. And we're like, oh, we got a notification. Now they have placed the order. So in this case, I know in about maybe five, 10 minutes, my noodles will be, will be ready. So I can basically say, okay, let me maybe compile, make sure my program compiles before I go eat or do something, just kind of in the interim. Oh, I'm hungry. So in the meantime, in the, you know, we do whatever we need to do, and, and then the, the noodles are all cooked. So basically over here is, is kind of all cooked. It's another observable, essentially, that notifies me, so sends the notification to my mobile phone. And then so telling me, okay, your noodles will be ready in two minutes or something. Then we'll say, awesome, then I can basically uh, like, you know, do whatever, or finish whatever I was doing or put it on hold. Then I can go to the restaurants and my noodles will be ready. So in computing terms, this is more time saving. There's not much of a waste, waste of time. Because I place my order, I go do something else. Um, and that's the idea of uh, reactive programming, reactive systems. So then you can be free up to do something else rather than waiting and blocking. So yeah, so again, that's just an example. You can think of many examples that reactive programming can be useful in your life and reactive systems too. And, that would, and according to Vancat too, this reactive um, paradigm should become more like the, the main thing in the future uh, of computing. So, Okay, so now I'll go back to my, the last part of my um, presentation, which is the, the survey of the four um, libraries. Um, and these are not quite like frameworks, they are really called tool, toolkit and libraries. So first of all is RxJava. So RxJava, um, it's basically came out of reactive extension, um, reactivex.io, if you want to take a look. Um, and it's very popular, especially on Android. <coughs> and it's also available in JavaScript, .NET, Scala, Clojure, and all these other um, popular language frameworks. Um, it actually came out, Reactive Extension came out of Microsoft. It was actually .NET that someone in, in Microsoft decided to develop the Reactive Extension for .NET. And then basically then Netflix took it and decided, well, Java we can make use of such a framework. So they ported it to Java. And it came out in 2014, and at the time, it doesn't have any, um, it, it, yeah, that's pre before the reactive stream specification in 2014. And the latest version is version two, which came out in 2016 with flowable and back pressure. So essentially, yeah, that's what it is. And also too, Rx Java and also the Spring Reactor, the two engineering teams, they actually work together. So you'll find that the two are similar too, in some ways. But RxJava started before Java 8. So it's, it doesn't, yeah, it, it has its own kind of API and everything in some sense because of that, so. And, okay, so this is just an example now to, um, how do you do it like a hello world? Um, again, this is just very basic example. It's not like real life, but just wanted to point out too is that um, if you do like use an Rx Java to implement a hello world, it's actually quite simple in here. You just can do everything in one command statement essentially. So you use a flowable and do a dot from array, take the arguments and basically immediately you subscribe to it. Um, and basically there are subscribe is a consumer that basically in this case is print out, do the system out, print line, hello, and then takes in the argument, which is whatever you pass in, hello world, hello somebody. So again, just wanted to point out it's, it's pretty clean um, using a reactive programming approach. And Java, and Rx Java too. And here too is an example too. Um, it's not so much of a real example, but just want to show again that how do you attach a producer to a consumer. So this is an example. So your observable is basically do a dot just. In this case, is your list of input. In this case, is your events that comes in. And your consumer, <coughs> in this case, is just do a system out print line. And to attach them together is essentially doing observable dot subscribe and pass in your consumer. So that's how you do it. And the next we'll talk about um, Spring Reactor. So Spring Reactor is based on Project Reactor from Pivotal. And it's very similar to API to Rx Java 2, as I mentioned earlier, because the two teams of engineers, they work together. Um, and it's, um, for Spring Reactor, it, it's actually started after, uh, after Java 8 comes out. So it actually has a, a cleaner interface to it too. And David Karnock, who is project lead of Rx Java, also contribute to the reactor. Um, and he quote, there's just a quote in here that he says, if you can use Reactor 3 if you're allowed to use Java 8 or higher, and use Rx Java 2 if you are stuck on Java 6 or if you need your functions to throw checked exceptions. 
And here are our list of all the libraries that, that comes out of Reactor. The core is what you use for developing your code, and then there's Reactor Test and Extra Netty and Adapter. It integrates very well too with Kafka and RabbitMQ. And also has incubating Reactive Streams uh, foundations for .NET and JavaScript. So here is just an example of some coding in here. Um, not Hello World, but just a coding to kind of compare the traditional approach and also using reactive approach. So in the top part here, you see traditional approach. Um, we're doing this method inside. You, when you run it, you see that first it prints out traditional way started. And then over here, th this is the part that we're trying to get the list of products. And again, this is a blocking call. So what you see in, in this case is that your method will then block, basically waiting for the list of products to come back. And when it com comes back, then the, this second print, li print line will then come out that says traditional way completed. So you can see this is using traditional way Spring MVC. This is blocking call. You have some wait time to it. However, using reactive approach, um, Spring Web Reactive Web Flux, in this case, it's basically we're making use of the flux. And over here, too, I just want to point out doing a get mapping is basically here, the, you know, your, your um, you know, URL to it. And over here, too, there's this one, the text event stream value. This one is essentially signals that this is event can be subscribed by the client that's interested in this method and subscribe to, this, to the server send um, event to actually essentially get back the, the response. If you want to make this a bit more reactive, even in how you get back the, the response. <coughs> and over here, so if you run, run this, what you'll see is that you'll first see reactive way using flux started. And then the next line is what it is trying to actually get the products as a stream, from the stream, and returns you a flux. In this case, you're basically holding on to your flux and not actually getting back your list of products. So what you see instead, if you run this, you actually see the next line comes back reactive way using flux completed before you actually get back your list of products. Because at this point, you just hold on to your flux. It's like a ticket. You go to the store, you buy something, or you wait in line, you get a ticket. You, you don't actually get your, your desired things yet. You just get back a ticket, and you have to wait. So in this case, what, how it will function normally is it's kind of like the normal way. So when your response comes back, it will fill up the sync. And basically, it's the normal HTTP way. And the list of products will then returns, returns to whoever is interested in that. But otherwise, too, again, over here, I was just pointing this out because you can also have the clients basically subscribe to the server, server source um, event. Um, I think it's server source event. Yeah, I just cannot see my notes in here. So, um, and so if you subscribe to that event, you basically have the client is like very uh, reactively kind of subscribe to the response to, um, to kind of basically get your response back. But however, if you do it like that, then, then it means the client will then have to deal with also like when you're waiting for asynchronous response. So some of these things too, when the you know, connection closed and all that kind of stuff, which I won't go into detail now, but just something I thought I'd point out to you too. Here, and it's just a, a, like a quick comparison too, again, between RxJava and Spring uh, Reactor. So think of these uh, a bit more like reactive programming, less of like reactive systems kind of capability. I mean, it has reactive systems capability too, don't get me wrong, but they're, they're really designed more for reactive programming side of things. So these are just the comparison, but I'll have these slides made available to you. Um, but essentially, Spring Reactor came out in Java 8, and RxJava came out of Java 6. So that's some differences. And then the different times that they came, come out. Um, and then basically, in RxJava, and currently, RxJava 2 has observable and the back pressure support now, um, but it didn't used to in RxJava 1. And Spring Reactor actually is, is more pretty um, kind of fully capable too, um, and has the flux and mono. Um, so yeah, so that's the comparison. So now I'll, I'll go to talk about a quick introduction to, to Akka, if you haven't worked with it yet. Akka comes from Lightband. And IBM has a partnership with them um, in, uh, in 2017, uh, in June. So that's the URL for it. And it's basically ACA makes use of the actor model. Actor model is not new. It comes out of Erlang in the 80s. And basically, it was the telecommunications that demands like real time. So Erlang is actually handling like 
failures very well too. And that's what essentially actor models making use of the supervisor capability. It's really coming out of the Erlang concepts. And it's event-driven, uh, location transparency is very lightweight. And again, I wanted to point out the resiliency, recoverability, and its supervisor capability, it's, it's very powerful. Here, so another like example of using a hello, hello world in this case, you'll find that the coding will, take, will be a bit longer. The reason is because of the actor model. You need to express, basically, everything is essentially um, actor. So in your, in your main, then what you see is that it's simple enough. It's just basically, you start off your main. it's like the main engine. And basically, it takes in your, the actor class. In this case, it's hello world. And basically, that's what it does. So we'll take a look now into the Hello World. So in Hello World, you see that it extends abstract actor, but the part is, interest, is of interest is basically the pre-start. So what the pre-start in here does is that it creates the greeter actor. So again, in ACA, we're make, making use of actor models, so we have to have another actor that handles the greeting part. So over here, you see it's, we're doing get, get context, doing a dot actor off, and basically, create your actor class in here. So basically, too, it's, it's telling it what does it needs to do is basically do a greeter.tell and basically print itself out. OK. And now let's take a look at the greeter um, uh, actor. So the greeter actor, too, again, extends abstract actor. But it's actually becoming somewhat simpler in this case, because once it's being instantiated, it's just basically waiting for message to come in and does its work. So in this case, when it receives a message, then it basically returned the receive builder dot match equals and then do a system out print line hello world and then basically sends itself back and basically print itself out. So yeah, so this is um, how you would do it in ACA. It's a bit more involved, more coding, again, because of the actor model. Um, but as such too, if you do very complicated systems, it's actually very powerful. Um, so. And here is an example of Akka doing the same Hello World and it's in Scala, which I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but as such, you can see that Scala itself too, is, um, it's, it takes a bit of a lesser code in here too. Um, so, okay. And I have five minutes, I think, so. All right. Okay, so now it comes to the last um, of, of the, all these tools comparison. Um, this is Vertex. Um, I'll talk about Vertex a little bit. And it comes from Eclipse. And the, the very um, advantage of it is that it's a newer framework and it, it's very polyglot in nature, meaning that you can actually combine in your Vertex code, you can actually call JavaScript, call Ruby, for example. Um, so it's very polyglot in nature. Um, it doesn't make use of the actor model, but the model it uses is called verticals. So verticals are similar in actor um, in concepts, but it's not the same. And the, the essentially, this verticals is basically components are being deployed and executed by Vertex. And it's event-driven, and they run only when they receive a message, much like a lot of the other reactive systems. So, And it has a Vertex event bus, and it's not restrictively tied to any container. It's basically that these libraries, again, can be used with other libraries too, meaning other languages libraries as well. Okay, so this is an example of Hello World in Vert, using Vertex. So you see that also is, is um, pretty clean. Because you, in your main, you just basically do a Vertex and do a dot Vertex. Essentially, then you create your HTTP server. And basically, too, you can then chain your command and do a request handler. And basically, then print out your resource and doing Hello World in this case. And then you do also like a dot listen and binds this call to the port 8080 for your HTTP listener in this case. So again, you can see to Vertex is actually also quite lightweight and very um, kind of uh, concise and elegant too in its approach. So I think I have a couple, three minutes. So okay, so when it com comes to here, I just want to do a quick recap and takeaways. So um, some of the things I already talked about. So reactive programming and systems may be different too if, if you have already been doing programming, maybe the traditional imperative style. 
But just want to kind of point out is that it, you know, it's don't, don't be like this of discouraged because even I've spoken with um, programmers who have done programming for a long time, but they when they first pick up reactive, it's a bit different. So, but don't get discouraged. Like I said, just keep doing it and practice and then you'll find it. It's actually very nice and very the elegance of it too. So would like to encourage you to pick this up if you haven't already done so. And I described some of the benefits and the, uh, um, and also the, uh, yeah, the elegance and, and describe some of the differences. But one thing I wanted to really point out is this last point is, is here. So reactivity to this day has not been fully been ready on the database level. Um, on the database, if you think of, you know, all, it, you know, strictly speaking, for any systems to be truly reactive is that all your layers, everybody has to do non-blocking, asynchronous, event-driven. But when it, in today's world, though, the database, um, especially in um, relational database engine, none of them are using non-blocking I.O. yet. So if you think of your systems, you do all these things, you go to the database, you still need to wait because your database itself is doing things in a blocking manner. However, you may have heard of R2DBC, for example, like from, from Pivotal, that's a database connectivity library. So on the connectivity level, there is non-blocking I.O., but when you get to actually have the database engine process, then that's blocking. So that's one note i like to point out to you too. Um, and I actually will be trying to interview some uh, database experts too to ask about would there ever be maybe like non-blocking I.O. Um, database and something like that. So if you're interested, please follow me. I'm actually intending to start a virtual reactive user uh, group online so then we can talk about things that are reactive in nature. So that will be one topic that I'm going to explore about database engine like non-blocking capability. So, okay. So thank you, I come to this point, thank you very much. And um, this is how you can um, contact me on Twitter and GitHub and all these. And also one thing I wanted to point out to you and invite all of you to sign up is the IBM Cloud. Um, this is the link, like the tiny link to sign up for it. Um, and it's, there's a free of charge and it's also for life too. You won't be charged anything, unlike some vendor that actually start charging us after one year, right? So we have like free tier access for a lot of our, comp some of our components. So you can sign up and do like any kind of experimentation. Yeah, we won't take your, your account away, so. And then all these three in the bottom here, they are about Lightband and all, also our reactive, um, reactive manifesto, reactive design patterns. Um, this is the book that I was pointing out, um, reactivedesignpatterns.com. Uh, that has a very detailed description of some of the patterns um, of reactive systems. <coughs> and when it com comes to here, I also wanted to point out too, at IBM, there's a an initiative, um, it's actually open to everybody in the world, and it's a global hackathon that you are all welcome to join if you're interested in it. Um, it's basically, you can join as yourself or join as a team, up to five of, five of you. Um, it's, it, you go to the link called callforcode.org, and basically it's um, a, an initiative for you to design an app, it's for like natural disaster preparedness. Um, and any kind of things you can think of. So it's a really for a very good cause, and also it actually has very good price money to it too. So please check it out if you're interested. So, and the deadline of it, actually here is small, is July 29th, so if you're interested, there's still time to enter into this hackathon, so. Okay, and I'll make these slides available too if you have missed anything. And here, I want to come to this point. Uh, thank you again for coming to my talk and also a huge thank you again to J Prime 2019, to Ivan, Dimitri, Michael, Martin, Naiden, and Deutschen. Thank you very much and all the volunteers in here. Thank you very much.